Hey y'all, so what do you do when God's perfect ways don't feel perfect? What do you do when God's perfect ways don't feel perfect, like at all, right? I'm sorry my voice sounds raspy. I've been getting over this cold thing and I'm just gonna open in prayer really quickly. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I ask um, that you would just anoint my words, that I would only speak that which you desire, nothing more, nothing less. Father God, even in my physical fatigue tonight, I pray, Lord God, that by your dunamis power, that you would strengthen me with a new grace to release this um, to your people. And I pray, Father God, that each and every person that needs to hear this, that their eyes and their ears would come across this video in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, y'all. So, um, I've been in Texas for almost exactly seven years now. I moved uh, from central Illinois here and, um, everything about me moving here was a leap of faith, like completely. And I will be completely honest in saying that it has been the craziest ride of my life. And, um, in that seven years, uh, God revealed to me, uh, some, some trauma in my life that needed to be healed. And so I went through a three of the last seven years, I went through a three to five year period of healing from trauma, from childhood trauma. And when I say it was not a fun experience, it was not a fun experience, but the result on the other side is, is more than worth it, okay? But what I wanna do is I'm gonna try to share this as quickly as I can, because I know in our, in our culture, people just don't have much of an attention span beyond about five minutes. <laughs> but if you are in a season of your life where we say that God is a good, good father, but his perfect ways don't feel perfect. So I'm going to read a scripture to you. Isaiah 55 verses 8 and 9. And it says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. That was from Isaiah chapter 55 verses 8 and 9. Okay. So um, when I began going um, through this healing journey, which now um, I coach, I coach men and women that have had past sexual trauma and past narcissistic abuse. And when I started going through this healing journey, I'm going to be straight with y'all. It, it was not a fun ride. Um, in fact, a lot of it has been excruci excruciatingly painful. And one of the most painful parts was not understanding what God was doing in my life in different seasons of, of those transitions, if that makes sense. And one of the things that I learned, um, I guess I wanna say the hard way, it took me at least a year to like get it. And then each time I would come across the same roadblock, I'm like, oh, so that's what this is. And so I'm gonna share what that roadblock is. So, um, if you have been raised by um, abusive parents, or let's say that you had a manipulative or abusive pastor or mentor or leader or coach or whatever, right? Especially if that person mentored you when you were younger, childhood, preteen, teenager. Uh, this could apply into adult years as well, but especially during those formative years when when your um, your mind, your will, your emotions, your your perception of the world is being formed by the things that you experience, right? Okay. And so what happens is is if if you've been raised in a chaotic, abusive um, home, or even let's say that you had a mother or father that was neglectful, that just neglected you, maybe didn't uh, abuse you a lot or manipulate you a lot, but neglected you, right? Okay. So unfortunately, what happens is whatever our relationship with our primary caregiver was like, so if your primary caregiver was a father or a mother, or let's say your primary caregiver was your grandmother or your grandfather or an aunt or an uncle or what have you, okay? So whoever your primary caregiver was, oftentimes we filter our relationship with God through the lens of our primary caregiver. I'm gonna say that again. We as adults often filter our relationship with God through the lens of our primary caregiver. And so I'm gonna apply this to uh, this scripture, okay? So as I was going through my healing journey, I kept hitting these roadblocks where 
I was either mad at God or I was angry with God or I was frustrated with God or I was impatient with God or I felt like God had abandoned me or God was being a big meanie up in heaven or he was demanding perfection out of me or he was being harsh and, and abrasive with me or blah, 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 right? And God would be like, Dawn, why, why do you, why do you feel that that's who I am? Well, that's how I feel right now. You know, <laughs> I was processing trauma, right? <laughs> Okay, and so what I learned by happenstance is that, um, so two of, uh, so I had a mother, a father, and a stepfather, okay? So two of those three primary caregivers, um, and I don't say this to shame them at all, I have completely, completely forgiven them, but two of the three were very abusive, okay? And so the manner in which they related to me as an adult, so, um, one of them was very harsh and dismissive. And so whenever I would come to God, I felt like he was being harsh and dismissive to me. One of them uh, demanded perfection out of me, like uh, abusively so. So I've always thought that God was demanding uh, perfection out of me. So I share this to say that sometimes we have to spend a significant amount of time getting to know God the Father, Abba Father, all over again because we filter how we react to him, how we perceive him through the lens of our primary caregiver. And if the lens of our primary caregiver was abusive or harsh, if the lens of our primary caregiver was distant and not intimate, not uh, close and supportive if our primary caregiver demanded perfection or was abusive or or maybe our primary caregiver just wasn't there you know what I mean like just wasn't there or said they would be there and didn't show up or whatever right and I'm sorry that I'm kind of belaboring the point I'll try to get to the point and, and move on but God would how do I say this God would allow during my healing journey, God would allow certain wounds in me to be triggered. And he actually allowed it. He allowed certain wounds in me to be triggered to cause that the, the misconception of his character and nature to rise to the surface. Does that make sense? Now, there were two sides to the trigger. The enemy was triggering me hoping me to hoping for me to get mad and angry and impatient with God hoping for me to be distrustful with God hoping me to be fearful or afraid of God the enemy was triggering my unhealed trauma wounds in hopes that I would become exasperated or frustrated with God or whatever and God in his his thoughts are higher than our thoughts his ways are higher than our ways his ways are perfect and ours are imperfect, right? God was allowing those wounds to be triggered so that the trauma would rise to the surface. So it would be like right in my face. So I had to deal with it, right? So he had the opportunity to say, Dawn, let me show you who I really am. Let me show you what my character is really like. And y'all, it it I'm going to tell you that healing trauma, I have no idea why I'm going there because that's not where I plan to go today. But anyway, um, healing trauma can be one of the messiest, yuckiest things of your life. It like the most exquisite um, catastrophe that could ever hit your life, right? And so what I learned was is in God's in God's perfect ways. So when the first couple of times I kept hitting up against these these triggers and God was trying to heal me of these traumas, it it really hurt and it really challenged my relationship with God and God kept saying, "I'm not your mother. I'm not your stepfather. I'm not your ex-boyfriend. I'm not your, you know, your girlfriend that betrayed you." You it basically, Dawn, you are casting onto me the same character and nature of people that have abused you or neglected you or betrayed you or manipulated you. And that's not who I am. Yet God would allow me to sit with that pain or that frustration for, I don't know, a day or so or whatever um, and allow me to keep pressing through 
the the issue to find to find God. Uh, there's a scripture, uh, Jeremiah 33, 3 says, you shall, you shall, um, or maybe it's not 33, 3, but it says that you shall seek me and find me when you search for me with your whole heart. It's in Jeremiah somewhere. I don't have the scripture reference right now. Sorry. And what God was allowing me to do was to press into the secret place and really discover what his, what his nature was like. And so while I was while I was wrestling through these first couple of triggers of me thinking that God was one way and he was saying no that's not who I am this is who I am and me wrestling back and forth with that and not realizing that in his love in his perfection in his perfect love for me in his thoughts that are higher than my thoughts in his ways that are higher than my ways even what I was pressing through felt yucky and it felt painful and it was frustrating and blah right in his perfect love for me he was showing me his patience, his kindness, his gentleness, his goodness. He was revealing to me and he was and uh yeah and he was pouring out his true nature upon me so that I would become solidified in those way areas where I really didn't think that he was a good good father. Now there's a there's a, a song that uh, is called Good Good Father. And the Lord started challenging me to sing that song every day. And when I first started singing that song, I'm going to be straight with you. I was mad at God. There was a lot of things I was going through that I did not understand. I was very frustrated with the Lord because he was telling me one thing and I was seeing something different in my circumstances and blah, 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 right? And I was processing through this trauma and it hurt and it sucked and I didn't like it. <laughs> and yet you want me to say that you're a good, good father? And y'all, y'all, that's how I felt. He says, I need you. I need you to sing that song. So I would play that song over and over again. Y'all, I lived in that song for about a month. By the time the end of the month came, and, and the breakthrough came long before the end of the month came, but by the time the end of the month came, there was a solidity in my heart that God is a good, good father, that he has never left me. He has never abandoned me. He will never betray me. He is not a man that he can lie. Every promise that he makes to me is yes and amen. Whether it happens now or 10 years from now or 100 years from now, God is a good, good father and his ways are higher than my ways and his thoughts are higher than my thoughts. So for any of you that are struggling in that space where you're questioning the nature and the character of God, let me tell you from somebody that has pressed through those questions and those uh, that internal wrestling in my soul, and I can tell you, he's a good, good father. So I'm gonna gonna end this uh, this little. I don't. It's not even really just a prophetic word. It's just a. It's just an exhortation. But I'm gonna pray for you real quickly. Oh, and before I pray for you real quickly, by the way, if you have not subscribed to my YouTube channel, please use subscribe right now. If you haven't hit the notification bells to get instant notifications whenever I go live, please do that now. Um, if you feel led to sow into uh, the ministry of this channel, to sow into this word, please check out the giving links in the um, in the description of this video. Uh, my primary calling, although I have a couple of other callings, but my primary calling is as a trauma coach, a prophetic uh, ministry coach to men and women who have had past sexual trauma and or narcissistic abuse. And so um, I just, I appreciate everyone for their, their generosity and their faithful giving to me and to the ministry and to the ministry of this channel. Uh, channel. All right. So I am going to pray for you guys right now in the name of Jesus, Father God. I thank you. And I praise you right now. I thank you, Father God, for giving them eyes to see and ears to hear what your Holy Spirit would say to them. Father God, in the midst of whatever situation they're in right now, where it doesn't feel like you're being a good, good father, that their head knows inside their head, they know that you're a good father, but their heart right now, Lord God, their soul, their emotions are wrestling within them and they're telling them a different story. And the enemy is, is, is battling them to and fro and tossing them to and fro, um, like a, a, a wave on the sea. And so father God, in the name of Jesus, help, give them strength to not be double-minded in this season. Give them grace and strength to, to hold 
hold un unswervingly and, and faithfully, even if they're holding by, <laughs> by the end of the rope, Father God, that they would hold on to their faith and trust in you. Father God, in this season, Father God, reveal your true nature to them in the name of Jesus. Reveal to them how the enemy lies to them and actually causes us to accuse God of having characteristics that are his. Y'all, I'm going to interrupt my prayer right now. The enemy lies to us so much that he will cause us to question the character and nature of God, and he will make us think that God's character is like his. Satan is harsh and abusive. Satan is a liar. Satan betrays people. Satan uh, makes false accusations against people. Satan manipulates and controls people. God doesn't do that. But what happens is, is because we live in a world where the prince of the power of the air, at least right now in this dispensation of time, he still has free reign to roam the earth to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. He can't devour everybody, so don't let him devour you. So in the name of Jesus, Father God, I ask that you give them grace and strength to push aside the lies of the enemy and to press into the secret place where they can discover your true nature, your true, uh, who you truly are, that you are a good, good, loving father, that you have nothing but love for them. Lord, your word says that you delight in the prosperity of yours in Zephaniah 317 that you rejoice over us with singing, that you literally leap and dance and twirl around as if under a violent emotion because of how much you love us, that you quiet us with your love. Excuse me, guys, I'm so sorry. In the name of Jesus, Father God, I ask that you would reintroduce yourself to them as the loving Father, as Abba Father, as Jehovah Jireh, as our good, good, good shepherd who only desires to usher us into green pastures and cause us to lie down and rest beside peaceful still waters. In the name of Jesus, that's what I pray for your sons and daughters right now in Jesus' name. You guys, don't forget to like, love, and share this um, video. If this video has been a blessing to you, put something in the comments. Say, um, what shall we say? His thoughts are higher than my thoughts. That's what I want you to put in the comment section. His thoughts are higher than, th high than my thoughts. All right, you guys, until the next video.